Welcome back, everyone. Our next talk is about efficient testing without assertions. Help me in welcoming Mr. Jeremiah Rossler. Jeremiah, welcome to HIPCON. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Um, so I want to start with an example right away. So um, this is a Selenium test. Who of, knew, who of you knows Selenium? Who has ever used Selenium? So a couple of people. Um, so what this test does is very simple. Um, it loads, in that case, a local HTML file because I didn't, didn't want to take any chances with the internet connection. Um, it selects an element um, based on its ID, namely username. Then it sends um, a username. Then it uh, selects an element based on an ID password, sends a password, and then clicks on sign in. So it's a, a pretty simple test. And then afterwards, um, what you usually do is you assert um, that what you did worked. So in that case, we want to assert that um, after we execute the test, we find the, the heading that says success. OK, let's execute the test. I slowed it down a bit so you can follow it. It's pretty straightforward. You see the login form, username, password entered, and we're logged in. And the test is green, as expected. So what do you think happens? And this, by the way, is the HTML of the underlying um, uh, website that, that we test. So what do you think happens if I remove all of the CSS, like just that single line? So all of the SS, CSS is gone. Um, the website now looks pretty different. And for all that a user can be concerned about, um, I would say it looks broken. What do you think the test will do? Will it tell you it's broken? No. If you execute it. And as you can see, the website now looks very, very different. And the test is still green, right? Um, if you do, so just let's revert the change. If you do something else, if you change the ID here um, from username to something else, or if you delete that ID, the HTML for the user doesn't look any different. So the user can't see that there's a difference. Do you think the test will now still pass? <laughs> so let's check it out. As you can see, the test, um, although the website looked, almost, looked the same to, to the user, so for the user, it didn't make any difference, the, web, um, the test now fails, saying um, there's a no such element exception. OK, now let's try a different test. First, let's revert the changes again. So this one is a test um, that's using the Recheck Web um, open source project. And it just wraps the driver um, inside a Recheck driver. But otherwise, it's the same. So it's using the same HTML, um, the same IDs. Um, everything's the same. So just to make sure, execute the test. Now on the unchanged side. As you can see, the website looks correct. Um, test executes. Everything's good. OK. So now let's do the same. Let's um, remove the CSS and see what happens. Ah, the only difference, as you can see, there is no assert at the, atom, at the bottom, at the end of the test. And now the test fails. Now the test says, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of differences. So this isn't what I expected. This isn't what I have, have seen before. Now the test fails. Now let's do the other thing, uh, re-add the CSS, and change the ID or delete it entirely. So any guess is what will happen? What do you think? Let's execute it and see. Website opens. And it can still identify the, um, the elements it wants to interact with, and the test is green. Now, this is what we would like to have, right? This is what, what uh, website testing should be like. I, I change something that is important for the user, and the test fails. I change something that the user doesn't care about, and the test still passes. This is what we would like to see. 
And this, by the way, is no fake. This is um, the real thing. So that I didn't like this is how recheck works, and I'm now going to explain you how how it does that. Okay, so what we that was a demo. Um, what we saw before is comparable to that. Like if you want to test an umbrella, you could say, okay, the umbrella works if it's if it opens. So in that case, the test would still be green because the umbrella opened. However, it's not what the user intended. So this is how current assertion-based testing looks like, and we want to change that. And um, for that to change, we do one thing different. So instead of defining the outcome in terms of an assert statement, instead of writing, I want to see a success message on the, on the website, um, we approve the current state. So we test manually, and then after our manual review, we say, this is what I want to see. And then we just notify you about changes. This is what regression testing is, right? If you think about it, automated testing in terms of regression testing is not testing. Because as, uh, what would you do if a manual tester would come and say, oh, look, we found a bug there, like two days before the release. Oh, look, we found a bug there. And it's been there for two years. You wouldn't change it, right? And test automation does the same thing. Test automation does not tell you about bugs that are already in your project. Test automation only makes sure you don't introduce new bugs. So it guards against unintended changes. And for that, we already have something that we use every day. It's called version control system, either SVN, Git, or whatever you use. But this is essentially what it does. It guards against unwanted changes. However, a regular version control only can handle static artifacts. So if you have a source code, the version control system you git tells you where has the code changed. Where has the CSS file or the, the, the JavaScript or PHP file or whatever, where has that changed? But what we want to see, actually, what we care about um, is what the end user receives. And the end user doesn't receive your code. The end user receives a running program, a running software. So instead, of where the code changed, we want to know where the software changed. And the software is different from the code. And there's more to software than code. There's uh, data configuration, runtime system, whatever. So that, that's just not enough. However, we, we recognized that a long time ago, and we um, filled that gap. So we want to know, instead of where the code has changed, we want to know where the software has changed, and that gap we fill with tests. So we execute a test in order to see where the running software now behaves differently than before. This is a, 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 a circumvention of the problem. This helps us to create the, the running software into a static artifact, namely a code, uh, sorry, a test, that we then can manage with our version control system. But this is what we're really interested in. Where does the software change? I want to give you a short example um, using uh, XML. So this is uh, a unit test again, and it's, it's a very easy one. So, it just, so this is uh, what we're going to test, the remove element transformer. And it just transforms the above element or the above XML. And as you can see, there's an, uh, an element called remove. That should be removed. And there's an element called keep. That should be still within the XML. And this is a typical assertion. What, what, what a typical test would look like, right? You would just make sure, OK, remove is gone and keep is still there. If you execute the test, um, this is what you expect. So the, this is the, the, the input, what you see above, and this is what, what you get from it, the output, and what you, what if, if that output comes out, the test should pass. And this is the case, so this works. However, um, if by chance the result looks like that, that, if that is the output of your test, it still passes. Because all you assert is that remove is gone and keep is still there, which is the case. That's not even valid XML anymore, but the test passes. And this is a big problem. We want that it only passes if it looks like that. And there's, um, there's um, an idea um, to solve that problem. And it's, it's been for like 20 years or something around. Um, and it's called golden master testing. 
And golden master testing essentially means that you create a golden master, a copy of the expected output, and, there, and then compare um, the actual output to the copy of the expected output. So for, um, for XML, you've got this, for instance, approval test library um, that's available in pretty much every language um, there is, like Java, Python, PHP, whatever. Um, now, obviously, this is uh, Java. And what you just do is you call it, um, you just say verify, in that case, verify XML. And this will make sure, so in the first time you execute it, it will fail because it, it, it's got nothing to compare to, so it will create the golden master. And the next time you execute it, it will compare the outcome to the previous run, to the outcome of the previous execution. And if there is only a, so much difference as a white space, the test will fail. So this makes sure that the outcome is exactly as you've seen before. So this um, passes as expected, and, and the other one that you saw before failed. So this is one possibility to turn automated tests, um, you essentially use them as version control. But if we go one step further, um, there's more to version control than just, than just um, history. Another thing of version control is, or if you think about, like, if you think about version control like that, um, you could say we blacklist changes. If you do an assertion, you blacklist a change that you, in that case of the, uh, like if that change happens, you want your test to fail. Like before, if the remove um, is in the output, um, then the test fails. Or if the keep is not in the output anymore, the test fails. Like we make sure that this property that we assert doesn't change unless, I mean, at some point we might change the code, then we might change the test. So, but at least we're notified about it. If this changes, uh, we're notified about it and can decide. Um, so in that, in that regard, your blacklisting changes. On the other side of the spectrum, is whitelisting changes, meaning that, um, as I said before, if so much as a white space changes, then you're notified about that. But maybe you don't care about white spaces. Maybe you just want to know it's, it's valid XML, however it's formatted. You don't care about that aspect. Um, then you have to um, whitelist uh, white that aspect. You have to say, OK, if it's valid XML um, and it looks roughly like that, you should, the test should pass. So you have to have a certain um, degree of, of properties that you can ignore. And um, for Git, there, like, for traditional version control, you have a mechanism for that that's called uh, Git ignore. And you just um, add like log files, class files, target folders, anything that you really don't care about in your version control system that Git should not notify you about. So this is a, a well-known concept. And now we just have to transfer that concept into testing. And the ideal amount of checks that you really want to check about, that you want, want to care about, um, is somewhere in between. You don't want to assert nothing, um, but you don't want to assert typically everything. So probably this, the, the middle way, the middle ground is, is the best, somewhere in between. But the question is, um, on which in, like, if, there is a, um, if there is a problem in your test or in your code, on which side do you want to err? Like, if, if something happens, when do you rather, would you rather be notified or rather be not notified, right? So there's a popular example from Google, and what apparently what they did is they have this dancing pony, this unicorn, um, which they use to mark changed elements. So if you're a tester, a manual tester at Google, and you see such a unicorn, you know that this is something that you should test thoroughly because this is changed functionality. However, um, at some point it happened that the markings were not removed. So suddenly, customers um, in production had dancing ponies, dancing unicorns on their screen. Apparently, there was no test guarding against that change. So the first thing you do usually is write a test, is there a dancing pony on the screen, right? Well, this is an instance of an unexpected change. So you can't write an assertion for that if you, if you don't you know, if, if that's something that would never come to your mind, if that's something you wouldn't expect, you can write an assertion for that, right? And um, with, this is an inherent problem of blacklist testing. This is the reason why when you create a firewall, you don't close individual ports, but you rather open ports that you know you need. Like in, in security, you don't, blacklists are inherently 
a, 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 a bad idea. You want to use whitelists wherever possible. So you want to be notified if something unexpected happens, and then you can still say, ah, OK, this is unicorn. I don't care about that. Please ignore it for the next time. But whenever something unexpected happens, I want to know about that. And also what we see is that usually you want to um, see uh, you want to assert more than not. You, you, so you, there's, there's more that you want to check than things that you don't want to check. So most of the time, uh, it's, it's a pretty good idea to start from the left and ignore stuff, because then you have far less work. So we call this approach essentially git for the GUI. And like, as I said, with a git ignore file, you can ignore... Um, files or changes that do, you don't care about, like log file, class file, target folder. And you can do the same thing um, when you use recheck web. So you can, for instance, ignore a class attribute globally. You can say, OK, I don't, I don't uh, want to see. Um, in that former case, I ignored the ID attribute. So the ID changed, and I wasn't notified about that because I had a rule that says ignore ID. I don't care about that. Um, you if you have um, like data, like um, additional attributes in your HTML5, you can use regex to ignore all of them at once. You can ignore um, elements like a link, a diff, a span, iframes I is a very typically a good idea to ignore uh, if you have like Twitter iframe or something. Uh, you can ignore banners, uh, 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 sorry, you can ignore uh, based on, on properties like ID, class, um, uh, XM, uh, XPath, whatever, and of course you can combine them. So you can say, I want to ignore um, the font of this specific diff for whatever reason, that font changes, whatever, and I don't want to know about that, or XPath, or whatever. And I now want to give uh, another live demo where I show you the strength of that. So um, we also created, um, out of that open source project, we created an open source um, Chrome extension that you can use. So these two pages are very different from one another, as you can see. So I just want to check um, how they compare. So I create a golden master. As you see, it's very easy to use, because you just say, check everything. Oh, sorry. And then I say, uh, I want to compare against that. So now I have a, a report created, and I can open that report. So um, as you can see, pretty much everything changed, right? So it's, it's very, very different. But um, using those uh, filters that I, or ignore um, um, language that I told you about, you can just say, OK, ignore, for instance, uh, font, ignore um, color, ignore border, ignore ID, ignore class, whatever. So you can ignore all of those changes. and say, OK, I only want to see what the contents changed, for instance. If they are text change, then show me the text change. So in that case, you see that, for instance, uh, there's two columns or two um, cells, table cells, where the, where the text uh, changed to, to a different amount. And you can use that for, for, for very different things. Like, you can do cross-browser testing. You can do um, you can chain, uh, check uh, different versions of the website, like the English version against the, I don't know, Spanish version, and ignore all the text so that you only see where CSS or elements changed, uh, stuff like that. So it's a very, very powerful way to compare different websites. And as I said, this is essentially how um, this works. So instead of, of saying, um, I want to assert that there's a text named success, I just want to check the whole website. And if I don't care about CSS, I can ignore all of CSS. I can say, uh, just show me the text change, any text change, or I can um, narrow down to whatever I'm interested in. Like chest, uh, if you know chest, um, you can also give it uh, individual web elements. So you can, only, you can say, I want to, I don't know, assert that the menu didn't change on these different versions of the website, whatever. So you can, you can very flexibly use that. OK, so yeah, I showed the filter functionality, um, but the ignore works the same. So you can define new filters, or you can adapt the ignore file with the, with the same mechanism. It just doesn't matter. 
So that's a demo that I already gave. Um, there are other tools available for that, um, that that do the same functionality that are mostly based on pixel diffing. Um, so what they do is they create a screenshot from the website, but they compare the screenshot pixel by pixel. And the problem, problem with that is, uh, for instance, if the whole um, screen um, changes for five pixel, um, then, then everything changed, right? So in that case, for instance, um, the sign in button as we are, ah, right? That's something I can show. So I can now use that one. So if I execute the test now, now I can show that before. Mm -hmm. So as you see, that, um, that login form now looks different because before there was a submit button and now there's a login button. And if I execute the test, it will fail. But it says exactly what the problem is. So if I open that, uh, if I open that now, when I prepared that already, then what you see is. Oh no, that's a different one. Sorry. Then what you see, okay. Uh, then what you see is that the, just the login um, is marked. So you see that, for instance, the class changed from button primary to button secondary, and that the uh, type changed from a link to a to a, a button in that case, and the text changed. And if you say you don't care about CSS, then you will only see the text change. So if if that's all that is important to you, that's all what we're what we're showing. And this is something that you can't do with pixel comparison. So if you have pixel comparison, um, you have other artifacts, like um, things shift because of the change. If you have a font change, for instance, uh, everything shifts, and um, you don't see where the text changed anymore. You, you only see like everything changed. But with that approach, you can ignore font and still see where the text changed. These are my backup slides in case a demo doesn't work. <laughs> Ah, another thing I can show, um, what is also very cool, is that this even works with um, animations. So if you, have a, if you have a website like that, not that would it make sense, but um, you can div that too. And this is something that pixel diffing obviously can't, so this wouldn't work. You can just create the golden master. Then you have another version of the same website. And you want to compare. So now you have that difference. And as you can see, there's a lot of differences. But if you ignore the positioning, all it shows you is that um, now it starts um, 0 0.3 seconds later. And there's a change in text in that there is a word, uh, word uh, change. And this is something that pixel diffing can't give you. So, um, to summarize, the benefits of, of using Recheck Web uh, for your project is that it's a rule-based deterministic ignore. So instead of um, an assertion-based um, approach where you have to specify what, what you want to have checked, um, now everything is checked unless you say so, unless you say specifically that you want to ignore that, that you want to ignore the color or the font or whatever isn't important to you. Um, it's open source. You, you can just download and use it. Um, it works offline because um, the Golden Master is an XML file that you can access. And it gives you unbreakable Selenium. Ah, that's something I want to explain in a second. And it basically, it works for any technical interface, but we just now implemented it for web. OK, so right. The, the thing some people are pretty much uh, sure about that uh, wonder uh, is how does it work with the unbreakable feature that I showed you earlier. I changed the ID 
um, the ID isn't there anymore, and still the test passes. How is that possible? So it works like that. Um, imagine, like we saw before, that you want to identify an element based on the ID. However, the ID changed, so the test typically would break, usually would break. What we can do now is, um, what we essentially did is, we, co we created a copy of the website, a complete copy of the complete website. So we can just go into that copy, find the ID there, then find other attributes of that element that we want to see, like element name, class, xpath, whatever, use the, those additional attributes to find it in the live version of the website and have the test still execute. So as I said, we go to the old version, the copy that we created, and find within the old version, find the element that we, that we want to have. Then we create a one-on-one -on -one assignment um, of all elements to all new elements and use the, the other, the redundancy on the other attributes that are there to make sure um, that we get the right um, new element. So we use the best match. We have a best match algorithm um, where you can, um, like, you don't want, it, like, if you added one button and removed another one, um, it could still be that you have a, an overlap of 20% or something. Um, and in that case, you most probably don't want to use that button. So we have a configurable threshold where you say, I want to have at least 50% overlap. And if you have that 50% overlap, um, then we use that best match and use that new element uh, within your test. So this is what you saw before. I can show again. So, so, um, right, let's see. So um, this is the demo app, and here I, as you see, I, I changed the, the ID, and I removed the other ID, and I want to execute the test again. So the test still execute and is green, because here within my recheck ignore file, I said that I want to ignore the ID, so I don't care about the ID in that case. I ignored it, so the test is still green. However, in the console, it now locks. Where is it? Right. So that the ID um, attribute that was used for element identification changed from username to something else. And it can even give you um, the file where you, where you need to change that. So because what, what this also gives you is one click um, maintenance of the tests. You now can maintain your golden master um, using uh, the, the recheck CLI, for instance. And in that case, if you, of course, adapt the, the copy of the website that you have and remove the idea in the copy, then this approach fails as well, right? So um, you can either update um, the code when you update the copy of the website, or you can even use a, a new ID that isn't even on the website. So works like this. As I said, um, this is the, the initial approach. We just go to the copy of the website, find the element there, uh, make a one-on-one -on -one assignment, and use the new element. However, we can go one step further. When we create the copy of the website, we can insert new attributes that aren't even on the website. So for instance, we can insert a retest ID that is not, that doesn't live in the actual HTML. And then we can refer to that retest ID. And that retest ID will never change unless you manually change it, because it isn't even on the website. So it can never be affected by any change whatsoever that happens to the live system. And with that way, you can even circumvent problems like this. Like if you have a, if you, I don't know what your test system looks like, but it, in some cases, there are no, mm, elements that can be easily referenced, like there's no ID, name, or XPath expression that makes sense. So sometimes you have very complex selectors to, to, to identify a specific element. Now that problem is solved as well, 
you can just add uh, whatever ID you like in the copy of the website and, and, and use that ID, and it won't ever change. So this is what it looks like. Um, the, the, the golden master behind the scenes, uh, the HTML side behind the scenes, is turned into XML. And that XML, um, you can edit and you can, you can view. And it has a, each element has an, an attribute called retest ID that you can, that is just text, you can edit it as you like. And this is what you can reference. So in your test, you can now say, I want to use the retest ID with that email. And whatever happens to the website won't affect your test. Okay? If, if some, like in that case where we changed from login, uh, from sign in to login, um, some clever engineer might, might have the idea that we also want to change the ID, making all your tests break. In that case, this won't happen. You just use the retest ID, and you're good. Um, what another thing that you can do with that approach is now you can create data-independent tests. So some people I know have the problem that they have a um, testing stage, uh, test system, and in periodic, um, uh, uh, like every week or every day, they get um, some percentage of life, live data from production to, to, to that test system. So that test, the database changes. So if they create a test, um, they have the problem that they um, now need to use different users, different whatever, um, because the data changes, uh, the underlying data. So you can't really write very good um, test automation because you don't know what to assert, right? If you create your test data independent way, like if you say, um, if you don't say click on user uh, Dave, if you say click on the first user on the website, then you now can create a test that is independent of your test data. Now you first execute it with the new data, create new golden masters, then you switch the implementation and execute it again. And now you use new data on a new implementation, and the test shows you um, where the implementation changed. This is now possible. And as I said before, um, it's open source, so you can just um, go there and download and use it. And uh, I would be very happy if you would do that <laughs> and uh, could give us feedback. So um, this is still, we are now in version 1.5, so this is still like um, early. Um, early adoption phase, I would say. So if you try that, and if you find anything that you, I don't know, that you don't like, please come and tell us, because we want to improve that, and we want, want to make this uh, more uh, usable. And as I said, there's also the Chrome extension um, that is also open source, but because it runs on, in the background, it uses our servers, um, you have to log in to use that. But you can create a free account and just use that as you want. So, um, I was a bit faster than I expected. <laughs> um, to sum up, um, this is a new testing paradigm, a new testing approach that isn't very widespread. Um, you probably know about Chest um, that's being used uh, widely in the React environment. This uses basically the same approach. It's, you can call it difference testing, gold master testing, characterization testing, approval testing. So these all refer to the same concept of creating a copy of you want to um, check and then show all changes. Um, and with that approach, you have a number of, of uh, benefits. Um, you can easily create the tests. As you just saw, um, you don't need to write any assertions. You just, ah, that's something I can show. So you can either use, um, an explicit checking mechanism where you say, I want to now create a gold master and check against that. Or, as I showed before, you can use an implicit checking mechanism. So um, that recheck driver will create a check after every action. So if you, uh, if you open a website, if you send a text, and if you click somewhere, it will create a check in the background for you. Um, so you don't need to care about that. So now. Now, essentially, what you now can do also um, is, I don't like the, the word because it's been um, with bad connotation, but you can do codeless automation in that you just record what a user does with a Selenium IDE, and you simply have to swap out the driver, and suddenly you have a test that works. 
Um, ah, and yeah, easy creation, as I said, and easy maintenance. That's an aspect I didn't show. So. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Now I want to use the other HTML again. So now what you see is again the test where the sign in button, the login uh, button changed. Uh, the sign in button changed to be the login button now. The test fails because it's an unexpected change. And now you want to update your golden master. Say this is what you, what you wanted, this is what you expected. So you want to update your golden master. Now that's fairly easy. Um, as you can see, um, you can either say you want to ignore all of the changes or you want to, you, or you can do that individually, um, or you can say um, you want to accept all of the changes. And if you do that, um, then it will um, automatically apply the changes to your gold master file. So this um, this part of the functionality. So um, what we created, as I said, is an open source product, and you can use the recheck CLI, the, the command line interface, to update the gold masters. If you want to use uh, the GUI, this is the commercial part of the of the whole talk, the two minutes. If you want to use the GUI to update um, your gold masters, uh, this is uh, where a small fee comes in. So um, there, uh, Git and GitHub is our our um, role model. So Git is is free, and you can just use it using the CLI. If you want to use uh, many of the um, GUIs available for usage with Git, uh, are, uh, come with a small fee, and um, we do the same thing. And also, you can, as just showed here, you can upload the artifacts to our servers. If you want to do that, um, there's also a small fee. So yeah. But the, mo the most of the functionality is open source, and you can fully maintain the gold masters also using the, um, the command line interface. Yeah, um, unbreakable selenium. Um, so the, this concept also gives you additional benefits over easy creation and maintenance of the tests. Um, it's now also possible to um, have the tests not break like immediately. Um, but instead tell you that something changed, and if you apply that change to the Golden Master, that the test will then break. And actually, um, something that we are trying right now, instead of giving you that log message that I showed earlier, oh, it's gone, okay. Uh, the log message that I showed earlier, here it is. Um, we now experiment with um, update, the, update the, the actual code. So instead of telling you to do that, um, we experiment with actually doing that for you, changing your code files for you. But that's an ex experimental feature that's not available yet. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, thank you for um, attending the talk. Um, if you think that is something that you would like to try, we would be very happy if you could give us uh, GitHub stars, because we are um, a venture capital-backed uh, startup, and um, as I said, we, we, um, most of the functionality we provide is open source, um, but we have to show for our investors that people like the approach. So if you think this is something worthwhile, um, please help us spread the word, um, tell other people about it, and give us some stars, because this is how we convince our investors um, that this is something that, that could work in the future and that, that people like, a concept that people want to use. So, um, are there any questions? Thank you, Jeremiah. Any questions? Back there, okay? Hello. Uh, so, where does the master record live? Is it part of uh, Project Git repository or...? So, um, very good question. Um, you can um, configure um, how you want that. So, the default is that we assume it's a Maven project. Um, so we have a um, project layout uh, predefined for Maven and Gradle, um, where we just say um, that the Golden Master should live under source test resources. So I can show you that. Uh, source test resources, retest, recheck. So this is the file I created uh, earlier. Um, it's an XML file, and there's a screenshot. But the screenshot, it's not pixel comparison. The screenshot is really only uh, for documentation. 
but this is um, what you have, and you can uh, commit that to your um, GitHub repository, and because it's XML, um, it works with merging and, and uh, all usual Git, uh, uh, like uh, rebasing and everything, uh, uh, usual Git operations. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Hi there. <coughs> Uh, do you maybe have examples of command line interface you mentioned about? Can you, sorry, can you repeat that? Do you that? maybe have example at hand oh. of command line interface that you showed us, that you talk about and didn't show? Other interfaces. Um, so we have an, um, these are only proof of concept implementations. So ah, we implemented this um, in an earlier version for Java Swing. So we have a couple of clients using this on a large scale basis uh, for, for Swing applications they, where they check one million elements per night uh, for changes. Um, but um, for XML and uh, lock, we only implemented um, a prototype. So we, we show that it works, and it's not, not much work to implement. Um, but we haven't, like, these are not production-ready implementations, I'd say. Does that answer the question? Actually, no. Uh, I'm <laughs> talking <laughs> about that uh, tool that you were showing to uh, compare golden master with uh, test uh, run and you said that it's for the fee right ah okay and you said that there is a cli tool yeah. Yeah. do you have it here to show us thanks ah uh, that's something actually i didn't prepare um let me see oh. yeah um so I can, let me see. If it takes a bit more time, Jeremiah, you can maybe show it later on. Yeah, yeah. okay, we maybe can do that. Better. So I have it with me. Um, as you would expect, it's, oh, I can make that bigger. No, I can. Um, so, no. Um, as you see, um, it gives you the div command uh, where you can take such a report that I showed earlier, and it shows you where, it difference, uh, where there are differences. You can say you want to commit those differences or apply them, and you can say you want to uh, ignore uh, all the differences. Then it adapts the ignore file. So it's essentially the same functionality as you saw on the GUI, but it's, um, it's less visual. So. Thank you. Any Hello. This, sorry. So if we may, uh, it's going to be a short one. So. Um, I think you ah. you hi, hi. you were mostly working with some desktop examples. So how do you generally deal with uh, resolution? Is your uh, tool resolution agnostic, and could it work with uh, mobile browsers, even mobile Chrome yeah. version, if if there's a driver applicable, etc.? So. Yeah. So we experimented um, also with, um, for instance, Source Labs and um, what's that? A browser Stack, um, also with mobile. Um, um, like, as I said, cross-browser testing and cross-device testing also, and um, with the same mechanism as I showed you. So it will report initially uh, the differences in resolution, but with the mechanism I showed you, you can just say, I don't care about resolution, I don't care about x, y coordinates, only show me if, for instance, an element is now missing, or if, an I don't know, if the font changed, or if whatever. So you can, um, you can say you want to ignore the, the resolution um, artifacts uh, on a semantic level, and only be shown um, what else changed on the website. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, how well does the best match algorithm work? And what would happen, let's say, if there are two best matches that the algorithm finds? Maybe there's a login button and there's also a register button, mm -hmm. you know, both black in color. Uh, and my second question relates to uh, how does this interfere with timing issues? So let's ah. say the reason why the algorithm doesn't find an ID is because some script hasn't yet started, has finished executing, or maybe there's some network you know, uh, delay. Yeah. So um, thanks for the questions. Um, first answer is, um, I'll answer the last question first, the timing issues. Um, so for now, um, we don't address those. So for now, if you have a, usual, a, a typical Selenium test, you would have to solve the timing issues as well. And you still have to do that, frankly. So um, we don't solve that problem yet. But um, there are concepts where we can do that, because we have much more information. We can now say um, we have a website with 50 elements, and uh, with a check, um, you have 150. So there are some missing. Maybe we wait some more. 
So there, there are some things possible that weren't possible before, where we say, okay, we want to wait until we have like only 10% difference in, in the amount of elements, um, but that's not implemented yet. So, but it's open source. If you want to go ahead, you can do it. Um, that's uh, the, 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 the last question. And the first one is what happens if there's um, uh, a match of everything? Um, I, I have to admit that we, did, we haven't created um, artificially a situation like that, but I think it's very, very unlikely because you always have like an X-path. And um, I mean, first of all, it's, um, it's a gray area. Like if you have a human tester, and as I said before, you have a button that's r uh, removed and a button that's added, um, when would a human decide that it's the same button, right? If, if, if it's, so th there's a gray area there that, that, that's hard to decide at some point whether it's the same element or should be the same element or be regarded as the same element or not. Um, and um, so it, 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 I think it, the situation that two elements are very, um, very close to one another um, can happen, but they are very, uh, the, the identical match can't happen because there's always like the X path and stuff that changes. So one button, one button, for instance, will be the first button in the X-Path, and the other the second button in the X-Path. So we take the first one. So yeah. But as I said, it's a gray area. And um, you probably, so we, for what we tested, um, the, the threshold we set as a default works pretty good. Um, but if you have a special, si special situation, you want to maybe change the fr uh, threshold. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. So Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you very much. <laughs>